Hello everyone, and welcome to this mini-lecture on African American Identity in Popular Culture, Part 1. So one thing we have to look at as we get into looking at popular culture and understanding how it represents identity and how that then shapes other people's perceptions around identity, uh, we really do have to look at the history to get a sense of where we are today and to get a sense of how um, in particular race and we'll be focusing on African American identity here but this certainly has applications to uh, all different races and really uh, a, a wider range of of different types of identity so the first thing we want to look at with African American identity is that in terms of history outside of uh, popular culture we really do have a very complicated history that has is both, I guess you could say, literally and metaphorically bled over into popular culture. So first we have to deal with is this long history of four, over four, 400 years of dehumanization of African Americans. Right, so as early um, as we see in the 1500s and the rise of the slave trade, we see this dehumanization. We see this view of African Americans, or, or really Africans, um, as less than, as not as equal to, as questionable about their their humanity and there's lots of reasons of this if you study the history of of Europe the Americas and Africa uh, there's a lot of ways in which this came to be that this lecture can't really address but I think it's important to know that when you have something that's 400 years old um, or has been a process of 400 years that does become what we would call institutionalized that does become a frame that is just naturally absorbed by many, no, though not all, in the culture. And within that is a long history of scientific dehumanization. So it's not just the culture viewing people, uh, viewing people of African descent or African Americans as suspect, but trying to scientifically prove this. I mean, let's think about that. If science was there to say you as a human being are not a human being, what you know, what does that say about our culture? What does that say for those people that are the target? Uh, so we have to understand that there's been a long attempt, to, you know, and I put science in quotes because it was often really bad science, and it's still bad science. But, um, you know, we see this long history of scientific dehumanization, and of course we see this long history of legal dehumanization. That is from within the United States, from the, from the, um, from the 1600s, uh, through the 1900s, and some would argue the the 2000s, when we look at certain bills that, such as um, as we'll talk about later, the Supreme Court and their ruling on uh, the Holder case in, in vote in the Voting Rights Act. But we definitely can make a strong argument of the legal dehumanization of saying that you know people of people of African descent or African Americans don't have these rights, even though we are a country born of uh, an attempt at some level of equality, at some level of democratization. So, you know, we have to understand that these three things, the cultural dehumanization, and that came in many forms. It came in, you know, just the ways in which people talked. There was justifications of, you know, people used justifications from the Bible. There was all sorts of cultural dynamics that set African Americans apart and the science and the legal those three things really did make a difference and of course they they influenced how in what our popular culture is now to talk about this I think it's important we take a step back and understand the difference between individual and institutional forces here because whenever the discussion of race comes up or challenges around race racism and the like a lot of people, particularly people that might either directly or indirectly feel threatened or feel this isn't an issue anymore, in part because they themselves are not a target, uh, I think it's important to kind of identify some of these differences. So when we talk about individual choices, 
particularly in in the U.S., we have this very strong drive for individualism, and so we we preface or we believe everything is on the individual and ignore often those institutional forces. So when we're talking about individual choices, we're talking about the range of choices that an individual can make. And that's based upon what is usually realistic within his or her purview. And, you know, I, I like to think a, a good example of this, you know, if I look at myself, is, well, you know, I, there's a range of choices I could make with my career. And what, but what are the realistic ones within my, within my purview? Well, realistic one is that I will never be a brain surgeon. I don't know if I have the intellectual capacity for that, but I tell you what I don't have is the steady hands. In fact, I could probably never be a surgeon of any kind because I don't have steady hands. And so therefore, that's not a, re that's not a realistic choice within my purview. In one little catch with this issue of individual choices that comes up is that very much so we get this mentality that if I can, then everybody else can. And I, I don't think that's realistic in a lot of different ways, but it's, a, it's an idea that permeates within our culture. It's an idea of the individual that if I as an individual can do it, then everybody else that can't, it's because they're not trying hard enough, it's because they're not good enough. Uh, th there's this attempt to externalize and, you know, or, or to really internalize what their faults are rather than identify what might be other factors. Now the reason I mention this is this can only work, elements of this can only work, uh, particularly the first two, can really only work when everyone, not just some, not just many, but everyone has access to adequate education, due process and fair legal treatment, safe and equitable employment, affordable in safe living space, a safe and healthy environment, and a reasonable level of health care. And what we have to understand is historically, when I talk about institutional forces and racism, historically we see much of these have been denied directly or indirectly to African Americans and other minorities. And so what we see is the, the denial of access to these things, right, means that the ability to make good choices, substantial choices, the right choices, diminishes. And so what becomes within a person's realistic purview when they don't have access to these is much more limited, is much harder to make sense of. So we have to recognize that institutional forces do play a role in how individuals make their choices. If you don't have access to adequate education, how do you know what are the right skills or how do you learn the right skills to do the different jobs or to find jobs that are, you know, provide an opportunity to move up the socioeconomic ladder. If you don't have due process and a fair legal treatment, then what happens when you are driving in, a t in, a, in an area of town that you don't live in and you get pulled over by the police because you don't fit the actual, you know, you don't fit the identity. You know, do you end up in jail because you aren't able to legally represent yourself or find that legal, legal protection. So we do see these play out, you know, for hundreds of years and still to some degree even today. So let's take a look at kind of what's going on in popular culture history and contrast that with that with what's going on in legal history because again, I think this is important to see the parallels and the challenges going on here. So, in the 1830s, we see the rise of blackface minstrelsy, um, and, and we'll talk about that much this week and kind of what that, what that means or how that changes people's perspe perceptions, and, and we've talked about it a little bit before, um, but we'll really, you know, we'll see kind of how that plays into people's perception of who and what African Americans are and therefore their willingness to help or not help. Uh, we see, you know, uh, 1845, Frederick, Jer Frederick Douglass's uh, autobiography. It's the first of three that he does, if I remember correctly. And, you know, that being the start of 
publishing of books that provide more sympathetic uh, and empathetic responses or views of African Americans, slaves, and uh, minorities. In 1852, we have Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, though that's a fictional book, it was a uh, it was a melodrama that really captured a lot of people's interest, sent sentiment, and concern around slavery and the treatment of African Americans. And if we look at the legal history and we go back to 1787, we have, of course, the U.S. Constitution in the Three-Fifths Compromise. Now, the Three-Fifths Compromise, the purpose of that was that African Americans or slaves would be counted as three-fifths of a person. And that count related to how many people were populating a particular state and how that, that population was, a calcula was used to calculate how many representatives a state would have in the House of Representatives in Congress. But what we have here is a legal document that essentially identifies African Americans or slaves in this case as three-fifths of a person. Right? Just more than half human. That's what the that's what the three fifths compromise is. Eighteen twenty, we have the Missouri Compromise, which essentially says, you know, states north of any new any new territories north of Missouri or the I think it was the thirty sixth uh, parallel would be non slave states, would be free states, and any any states or, or territories that become states south of that line would become slave states. So it's, you know, here we have this just straight out line that, I mean, just this line on a map that says anything above this is a free state. Everything below this is a slave state. So again, it's a compromise, but what, it, what is it compromising? It's compromising people. It's compromising people. 1850, we see the Fugitive Slave Act, which, of course, you know, any slaves that ran away, the punishment, the expectation that they would be retrieved or could be retrieved in free states also becomes, you know, writ law. Again, it says no matter what, you are and you will always be property. Following on that was the Dred, the Dred Scott decision, a and this was a famous legal case in which, of course, Dred Scott uh, is a slave who escapes to a free state and argues that once he's in a free state, then he is free. Uh, the courts decide no and put him back into slavery. In 1861, the Civil War starts, and by 1863, Abraham Lincoln signs the Emancipation Proclamation, and this is an attempt to really, it's a symbolic gesture because it doesn't really have much effect until, of course, the Civil War is over, but it is an attempt to free the slaves. 1864, we see the passing of the 13th Amendment, which is, of course, the end of enslavement and the ability to, um, the, the, the banning of slavery as a whole uh, in the country. So the, the, we had the proclamation, but the actual amendment was um, an amendment to the Constitution saying this is what will now happen. 1865, we see the end of the Civil War. The Civil War ends. The North essentially wins, and I'll put wins in quote only because of the devastation, you know, you know, across the country and kind of even in the aftermath, there's still a lot to figure out. And then we also have in 1868, the passing of the 14th Amendment. This is equal protection under the law. So the hope and the goal of this was for equal protection, was to make sure that a person of African, uh, an African American has equal protection under the law. Now, whether this has actually been upheld or the ways in which this has been challenged over the years is certainly, you know, there's been many books written about that subject. And then two years later, we get the passing of the 15th Amendment, and this was, uh, this was an attempt to eliminate race or color as qualifications for voting. So once it's clear that African Americans are going to be free, there's an attempt to unfairly prosecute them or um, use legal sanctions get other legal sanctions to get them against them so that's why we have the you know we see the rise of the 14th amendment and then of course there's an attempt to eliminate them from 
the legal process in an attempt to le eliminate them from the democratic process. So again, we see the passing of the, the 15th Amendment. And then 1877 marks the end of Reconstruction. Reconstruction is that period after the Civil War uh, until 1877 where the federal government is involved in the South in the recovery. And in many ways, there was a lot of problems with what was going on with Reconstruction. But one of the big things that was going on was African Americans were gaining voice and representation in their government in the South. Um, and when Reconstruction ends, that also brings about a, a certain degree of backlash that occurs. And then in that backlash we see by the by the end of the 1870s it comes in the form of the rise of Jim Crow laws and these were laws direct directed towards African Americans to limit their opportunity and their ability. So we start to see things like, like segregation, we start to see th the rise of water um, James Lowen calls sundown towns, and these were towns where if you were African American uh, and you were in that town out on the street after sundown, there was a good chance you were going to get arrested or worse. Within popular culture into the later 18, uh, 1800s, we see Mark Twain in his book Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, which is a very interesting book when you look at it in terms of race and some of the dialogue that Twain seems to be having with race. He actually follows that up with uh, a 10 years later with the tragedy of Puddinhead Wilson, which if you've ever read Huckleberry Finn, I recommend going and reading uh, the, the tragedy of Puddinhead Wilson. It is a fascinating story and Twain comes back to ask this question about um, ask this question about race and what race is. So we see this going on. Unfortunately, we also see the rise of lynching and lynching sylvaneers. And we'll take a look at that in the next uh, mini lecture. And that, that's a very challenging thing to see is the, the rise of lynching African Americans and then lynching sylvaneers, which were people taking photos with the dead bodies. And sometimes those photos were sent as postcards to other people. So really turning violence against uh, violence on African Americans into entertainment um, into souvenirs uh, is, a, is a very challenging dynamic within this history so between 1892 and 1896 on the legal history end we see the the case Plessy versus Ferguson and this case eventually and ultimately argued for separate but equal. So this was the rise of legal segregation. It was occurring already, but this case that reached the Supreme Court actually sanctified separate but equal. And it stayed that way for nearly 60 years um, in which we said separate but equal. And the problem with that is it was separate and not equal. I don't think you, you know, I think it's very hard to have separate but equal. I think that but equal is extremely hard to hold on to, uh, only because when you're create, when you're saying to these things need to be separate, you are saying they're different in a way in which they cannot go together, and with that comes an inherent or eventual attempt of hierarchy. Well, which one is better? Which one, you know, if we only have a limited amount of resources, who gets it? And historically we saw that whites got it and African Americans didn't. Between the 1890s and the 1910s, we saw the rise of enforcement of the one drop rule. And this is a, this is again, one of those crazy uh, yeah, I'll say crazy laws that just, you know, somehow people, well, for whatever reasons, people thought were right. The one drop rule said that if one of your great, great, great grandparents, and if you understand this mathematically, you have 32 great, great, great grandparents, right? Because you have two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, 16 great-great-grandparents, and 32 great-great-great-grandparents. If one of them was identified as black, was considered African-American, you would be considered African-American. Right? There's this very interesting attempt to 
isolate and to hold on to at least by the dom by 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 white culture to hold on to and really isolate African Americans. Um, I think I talked about previously as the the brown pay, you know the brown bag rule, which was another rule is that was that if you were darker than a you know your standard brown paper bag, you would be considered African American. So there is these these very strange rules to really keep African Americans contained, which should tell you kind of the concern of, of white culture about what's going on. So what do we see in the early 1900s? We see the Klansman by Thomas Dixon, which is a, which was a, um, I don't even know, you really couldn't call it history book, um, but this was a book that romanticized the South, uh, romanticized, I should say, the White South, the plantation owner, and of course the Ku Klux Klan, which is, you know, his, historically speaking, a an extremely racist organization. Um, so we see we see that book come out, and ten years later, Birth of a Nation is based upon that. Birth of a Nation is the first large cinematic film made in this country. It's uh, three hours long and it is about the rise of the KKK and really the reassertion of white power in the South over any attempts at African Americans African Americans goal to have power or to at least you know be, be legally and properly represented within the democratic republic that we are. Um, so that as a first, as the first film of our country, is a very, very interesting and telling moment. Uh, in 1924, we have the Racial Integrity Act of, of 1924 of Virginia, and this was the start. This, this again was also um, this law started to this law outlawed misogyny. And misogyny is just another word for interracial relationships. Um, this law basically said no um, people of, of white descent and people of, of African American descent cannot have relationships. Now this was interesting because it would be less challenged if it was a white male with a African American female. But if it was an African American male with a white female, that is when white culture felt most threatened. Um, and we see that time and again. Anytime there is a white male, an African American male involved with white females, it's somehow a cause, it's somehow a threat to white culture. And sadly enough, that has resulted in, uh, in many African Americans losing their lives or, or being seriously harmed. 1927, we see the we see the film *The Jazz Singer*. This is the first real talking film, and we have the character Al Jolson, who is a person. He, Al Jolson is Jewish, and he is doing blackface. Um, so again, we've talked about blackface before, but here it is in the 1920s, and forms of it are still in existence. So he's doing blackface in this show within the within the film. 1933, we see King Kong, which is a film that, when you study it and look at it, there's a lot of racial themes and tones there uh, going on. It's hard to not argue that it's very much a film that has strong racial undertones. 1939, one of the first earliest color films, Gone with the Wind, is this is another film in which the plantation owners in the South is romanticized. Slavery is meant to look n is meant to look like a fairly nice thing. Um, it's not. It's not. It's real. The the realities of it are s extremely hidden from the fr from the film. You you wouldn't know slavery was a bad thing if you if you watched Gone with the Wind, even though it's all centered around the South and the Civil War. 1920s to the 1950s, we see Amos and Andy, the radio and TV show, and this, you know, the, we'll talk about this, we'll listen to some episodes later on, but again, you have two characters initially who were um, white performing 
these two characters, Amos and Andy, who are who are black. And again, you could think of this as another form of minstrelsy, um, but instead of you know black face, it, it would be you could consider it black voice that they tried to sound like um, what they believed African Americans sounded like. The 1940s and the 1960s, we see the the civil rights movements and the attempts to really challenge all of these things that we see throughout the early part of the 1900s. Um, that includes, you know, the end of segregation with Brown versus Board of Education, and also the passing of the civil of the Voting Rights Act. 1970s, kind of as a response or, or it, both a response and and challenge of the civil rights movement we see the rise of black exploitation films and these were films in which we did have african americans as leads but those african americans you know they there was a hyper masculinity and a hypersexuality th that went on in these films that while it in some ways was extremely po you know was positive to have african americans in those roles was also challenging because they still at times stuck to traditional stereotypes of African Americans. We also see in 1977 the Roots TV series, a, a TV series, uh, the first mini TV series, award-winning TV series that um, really focused on the history of slavery and the impact on it, the impact of slavery on um, African Americans. And of course, in the 1970s and 1980s, there's a backlash that occurs to civil rights. There is an attempt to undo or to raise questions about what would, what had occurred. Uh, and we see this, this also happens with feminism, in that in the 1970s, 1980s, there's a backlash to feminism. Uh, there's an attempt to uh, raise questions or undermine the progress that had been made. 1992, we see the Rodney King riots. These are fascinating in the depiction, the events that occur, uh, the different the different challenges of, of minority groups involved, because it wasn't just African Americans, it was also uh, Korean Americans involved as well, and some of the, the stresses that were going on within these communities. 1946 to 19... 1946, 1994 to 1996, we also have the O.J. Simpson trial. Again, this depiction or, or these these depictions of African Americans and the emphasis around what they were doing. And if you go back and you study a lot of the language that's being used, it's fascinating because there is there is particularly cued language that should set off triggers about how th how people like Rodney King and O.J. Simpson are being presented as opposed to uh, as opposed to say uh, white Americans might be presented in the same way. We also have from 2008 to 2011 the birther movement uh, which in many ways was led by or, or strongly influenced by Donald Trump and it's hard to not identify this as racist um, and what I mean by that is very simply you know the attempt that prolonged over years and you still hear hints of it to say that President Barack Obama wa is not born of this country is not a citizen and therefore cannot be president is ridiculous uh, and despite other presidents being born again being born under similar situations where it wasn't perfectly clear but it was it was pretty well clear that they were a citizen. Um, we don't see the the vehemence. We don't see the attempt to uh, to, to remove the president. Um, and yet we, we see this with the the birther movement and all the ways in which they attempted to try to undermine the first African American president. And then also in 2012, we see the Trayvon Martin and the Stand Your Ground law. In the trial around that, and the questions around the application of that law, and you know how it is that that Trayvon Martin could be considered, or, or how Trayvon Martin's life ended, and what that means for people in different environments and different places.
So again, if we look over at what's going on in the legal history, we see in the 1990s and beyond social welfare reform movements. Um, and again, in some ways, if you look at the language around this, particularly from the 1980s and into the 1990s, the idea of the quote-unquote welfare queen, um, which was never actually a real person that Ronald Reagan talks about, it was a myth, and very much promotes this mythology around in particular, or, or, or often seems to be focused on minorities on social on whatever social social welfare they might be on, um, and it may not be said directly, but when you look at the language, when you look at the who they're targeting or geographically where they're targeting, you start to see that there is very much this is very much race related. And then most recently, the 2013. Um, Shelby County vs. Holder, uh, Supreme Court decision, and, which knocked down parts of the Voting Rights Act that we talked about previously and the ways in which this, um, again, returns us to the 19, or, or can return us to the 1960s and previously, wherein the right to vote and what you have to do to procure that is extremely challenging and problematic and in fact if you if you do some research on it now you will see many states have created conditions in which large amounts of voters who appear to be of African American descent or other minority descent are losing their opportunity and sometimes their right to vote so that's what we're seeing here, this mixture of popular culture and legal history. They blend in substantially, and there's a lot of overlap, or one feeds into the other. So I hope this has proved useful. Thank you for watching, and see you online.